So Sean, so great to have you here again. Um, it's many of you know Sean already. He's um, the founding director and chief learning officer with the Teaching Excellence Center. Sean's a former Head Start teacher and has provided early childhood mental health consultation training and coaching. Sean is a certified national mind in the making trainer and you'll learn more about mind in the making in our next, uh, the early part of this next year, where we're going to be having him do a mind in the making training. And you can learn more about Sean at his website, teachingexcellencecenter.com. Now, there may have been a change to that website name, Sean. I think I got something from you, maybe, if that's, is that correct, that you've changed coming, your website? It's, it's coming up. That, it's it it's coming up. Okay, great. So, but I will, in the meantime, put that uh, in our chat box so you can all access Sean's wonderful work. And uh, just a reminder as well that Leah put a link to the handouts also in the chat box. So thank you everyone for being here. We're just happy to have you here and Sean, thank you. So take it away. Thank you, Beth. And hello to everyone and welcome to another Learning with Training at First Five Alameda County. So for those of you who uh, stuck with us through all four sessions, thank you. And if you're new to the fourth session, there still will be something for you to chew on and, and take away in terms of playing, responding to children, experiencing stress strategies for adults. Uh, I'm Sean Bryant, for those of you who don't know, um, and I provide professional development through consulting, coaching, and training largely. Um, and I do this work uh, with the hope of helping adults who care and educate young children in different settings, places, and spaces. Because I believe when young children are afforded opportunities from the inside out, they become positive, productive citizens. And that citizenry, it starts prenatally. Um, and on the screen now, you just see a little bit about me and uh, who I am. One of the things that I'm currently doing as a strategy, um, for those of you who don't know, I'm actually in Philadelphia. I've been in Philadelphia since the beginning of uh, sheltering in place. And I don't want to say I got stuck, but I ended up um, needing to learn some things is what I tell myself. So I haven't lived with at home in over 30 years and I've been with my mother um, and it's been a learning experience, I think, for both of us. Um, yeah. And three weeks ago, I realized that I needed to shift something and what I s leaned into was this notion of gratitude. And I want to say three days in, I started to feel better. And here it is three weeks in and uh, I would take nothing else for this journey. I, I wish I had really stepped into how to demonstrate gratitude earlier on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so as a strategy for these times, um, I wanna welcome everyone to embrace gratitude. And of course, uh, last year I created this series called Tender Into Topics, because over the years, you know, teachers, social workers, specialists, clinicians, directors, we've all experienced these topics that are tender and tough. Um, and First Five was so gracious enough to host a few of them, the overindulgence, the death and dying. And at right at the beginning of COVID, uh, they hosted the homeless one. And I know that the overindulgence and death, dying and grief are on their First Five YouTube page. So if you have it, you might want to check those out. So Beth talked about what's on the screen now, um, the mind in the making. So it's an upcoming First Five sponsored session um, there are four sessions. Unlike these four, the, the, the mind in the making, if you register for one, you register for all four. So you can't come to one and not the others um, just because of how it's built. And um, we've developed so many strategies to investigate stress, trauma, and their connection to thriving that mind in the making was actually funded by the Jeff Bezos Foundation. They actually gave money to the National Head Start association and said we want a cadre of trainers across the country. So from January to December of 2019, um, they moved around the country and trained um, 25 people at a time in the training of training module. Um, and First Five Alameda is deciding to offer the Mind in the Making training to families, teachers, communities who support young children you know, in building the seven life skills that we call executive functioning skills. 
Um, and then later we might, you know, we're still talking about it, offer a training of trainers sponsored through First Five so that people can take it back to their respective agencies and communities and train others because that's the impetus for everyone to really understand, you know, that some other things happen in the top of the brain and like the trauma and stress trainings really get down to the stress level of the brain and the limbic system. But we kind of always leave where the learning part of the brain really happens, which is the executive center. We leave that to chance and we really haven't done an effective job of helping teachers and adults who work and care and love for young children understand how our actions need to be different when we're really thinking about that part of the brain. And that's what mind in the making does. So over a course of four consecutive Thursdays in January, we're going to dig into that. And I'm assuming that registration will probably open in early um, December. So look for that and make sure that you've signed up and that the first five emails are not going into your spam. Because if they're going into your spam, you're going to miss out on this, um, what I think is an awesome opportunity. And of course, um, to follow me, um, uh, I highly recommend signing up for the updates and news. I know Beth has, her email is in there. Uh, and there's some upcoming virtual sessions that First Five is in sponsoring that um, on the teaching excellence side we're doing. Um, and the first one, I think, I need to talk to Christine, is going to open up on this coming Monday. And it's the first 60 days of school during COVID in the preschool years. So that's something that um, is being offered. Um, First Five Alameda actually sponsored last December um, Black Child Wellbeing and Identity Training. Um, and with some new research and some new things that we're finding, um, the Black Child Identity and Wellbeing, I call it 2.0, uh, the Teaching Excellence Center is offering that. Um, learning challenges in, early, in the early years. Last year, we did a coaching summit in person at First Five in June of 2019. This year, the coaching summit's going to be online, and I'm excited about it because I think last year when we were together, everything got squished together really quick because we had to move and we were there all day. And this time, we get to spread it out over the course of four months so that people have time to chew on one topic per time virtually. So I'm excited about that. And we're offering some Saturday tender and tough topics for teachers. Um, so look out for that information um, in the coming weeks and months. By signing up where those red arrows are uh, flashing. And of course, for those of you who've been following know that I do this work uh, for a variety of reasons. And one of the reasons is uh, my friend and colleague Jade who really allowed me to get pushed to the forefront to start doing this work. In this virtual session, we're going to raise awareness, learn some skills, and practice some skills virtually. Um, and one of the main takeaways that I want you all to know is that reflecting and journaling when you learn virtually is one of the best ways in addition to sharing with each other. I mean, we're not doing breakout rooms in these sessions, but those breakout rooms, when you're doing virtual sessions, and it looks like we're going to be doing virtual sessions for the next probably six to nine months, even though I just heard right before this session on the news that they're testing the vaccine with 30,000 people um, and it may be available in phases and teachers are phase two. Um, but they're thinking not until the spring. So we're going to be still doing this for quite a while. So get the best out of these learning opportunities. And of course, throughout our day today, we're going to pause the process to reflect on our learning and our thinking. And our community agreements still guide us around being aware of our thoughts and our thinking. We want to share our experiences, so speak openly when the opportunity persists. Um, and always consider our role and responsibility in supporting and caring for young children and their families and ourselves. All right. So why this? Alameda County Kids has clear written goals in their strategic, strategic plan, and they include two things, that children are free from abuse and neglect, and children are ready for kindergarten. So everything they do, they wanted to support uh, those two large strategic plan goals. And we know that play releases stress, and that play is an excellent medium for adults to observe children and reframe our responses around behaviors, feelings, and thinking. There are some clear things we know and understand related to stress. When adults understand how our relationships with children and play are the top two ways that we can help lessen and relieve stress, we position children for healing and success. 
And adult stress can be understood in the context sometimes of supporting young children. If we consider me first, then we, then we really help and support young children. Today's session supports all children who experience stress. Um, however, we're gonna have a special focus on uh, children with delays and disabilities. And what we know is that these strategies, while they work to you know, remedy the emotional immune system, we know that children with delays and disabilities can have exacerbated stress because their systems are charged differently. But the beauty of these strategies are they work for every single person. And I know many people on the call today have been through a lot of folk from California and you've been through the, I was just talking to Linda Brock yesterday. Um, you've been through CSEPL teaching pyramid. And what oftentimes isn't revealed is that each one of those strategies actually has a foundation in special education that they were really researched on children who had um, additional needs. And when they work for those children, what we find is they often work for what we're going to explore today, typically developing children, all right? So just some information gathering that's good for you to understand in the broader context. So over the last weeks, we've done some building. We started with relationships as the foundation and moved to brain development and stress. We talked about developmental stress, which some people call developmental trauma. We talked about developmental, developmentally appropriate play. And we got through those things quickly. Um, and then we centered it around temperaments, role, and relationships. And I'm hoping that through all of those things, you all have been able to go back to YouTube and rewatch the videos and figure out what's going to be your personal action plan to support yourself and support children, um, which is why I was so happy that, um, well, I was, I'm open to posting everything I do for First Fire so that people have continuous access um, as a continuous learning process. Um, then we talked about attachment and attunement. Um, we moved up to self-regulation and how it supports um, self-control. Um, and then we talked about stress behavior and misbehavior and things differently happen in the brain. Um, and we ended with a play plan and how that can support stressed children. Last week, we opened up with emotional vocabulary and strategies and moved towards how to teach new skills and some specific uh, tenets around that. And then we juxtapose having a tantrum and having a meltdown and our responses need to be different because different things are happening for young children. Um, and we ended with stress, well, we actually started, but the other piece was stress management so that you all were able to take some things and say, I must care for myself before I can care for children. That old adage of let me put my mask on first before I put the child's mask on applies there. So today, um, in our short time together, we're going to do a few things. Um, we're going to talk about typical development and atypical development. Um, I'm going to introduce to many modifications and adjustments in our early learning settings. Um, we're going to talk about nature's role in relieving stress um, and then some sensory strategies. So as you all know, being therapeutic has been an umbrella statement and strategy in our time together. Um, Dr. Neil Horn said years ago, one need not be a therapist to be therapeutic. And Dr. Horn's quote captures attunement at its core, that notion to feel felt, a right to feel felt. And the hope is that we're all creating opportunities um, that we all can see and create in terms of our interactions with all young children as therapeutic, um, being in our, our body and our mind, contributing to overall well-being that notion of being therapeutic, all right? So I wanna to start today by actually using the annotate function. Hopefully most of you are familiar with the annotate function. Um, so on the next screen, what I want us to do is to open the annotate function on your screen and answer this question. How are you therapeutic with children? Think about your experiences with young children in what ways have you been therapeutic? In what ways are your interactions therapeutic? Or maybe in what ways do you plan to be therapeutic? You can answer that in any way you want, in any way you want. Okay, Alexa said modeling, awesome.
Is it okay if people put it in the chat too, Sean? Sure. Okay, someone said matching. Okay, thank you. So modeling and matching. Ways that you've been therapeutic, ways that you are therapeutic, or ways that you plan to be therapeutic with young children. Being reflective. Awesome. Awesome. Storytelling and coloring. Mm-hmm. Children love those. Validating their, oh, Lord Fish, validating their feelings. Yeah, someone said in the chat, uh, listening and guiding. Mm-hmm, thank you. Modeling and play. Creating playing. a space. A playing with them. Breathing together, drawing. Sorry, Sean. No, it's okay. Giving them a platform for reflection, I see, has been annotated. Mm -hmm. Staying calm. That's really important. That's mm -hmm. really important. Being attuned. Mm-hmm. Following the lead. So Narrating their play. That's cool. That is really important. Um, that that's really that acknowledgement and that uh, that process. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Beth around. Um, with, really, it's Cal Dweck's research, where oh. um, you know, in her research, Alfie Cohen talks about it as acknowledgement, and Cal mm -hmm. Dweck says, "I use the words process praise because that's the word that families are most used to, whereas in education we get used to jargon." Um, but in her research, where she actually found that um, tracking children from age two to age seven. Um, what we call in teaching pyramid PDA, positive descriptive acknowledgement. She calls it process praise in her research. And what they found was that children whose caregivers and parents um, actually narrated their actions while they were doing it. They were uh -huh. in the process of doing whatever they were doing. Some of them didn't achieve it, but while I was in the process of coloring, in the process of trying to do whatever it was, they narrated, they noticed it and just gave voice to it. They found that those children at age seven had two skills. They had perseverance and pro-social skills that they tracked back to actually narrating, adults narrating their actions while they were in the moment, which I oh, think is really powerful. So yeah. here we have a strategy, Beth, well, to everyone that costs no money. So this isn't something you need to buy um, from the store. It doesn't come in a box. It's literally, as adults, us saying, I'm going to slow down and watch what young children are doing and narrate what they're doing while they're doing it, which is quite powerful as That's a strategy. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. So we have listening and compassion, breathing and singing I see up here. Thank you all being present with them. All of those things and more um, are ways that we can be therapeutic uh, with and for children. And the takeaway is that as we continue to negotiate space with children, we need to be mindful of, are we being therapeutic or not? Are we setting up that situation or, or, or not is really the important takeaway there that uh, we, we want them to understand. I'm sorry, Beth, I'm trying to erase the, the, uh, the board so that we can move to the next one. Thank you all for that. So we define stress, um, I use, there are multiple definitions of stress, um, and I use the one throughout this session from uh, Professor Meteor, Emerita, Dr. Alice Sterling Honig, where she says a child shows by difficulties in personal relationships. And that part, if you notice throughout our time together, the running theme has been this notion of relationships as being utmost important and worrisome bodily responses that they are having a struggle and cannot cope with perceived difficulties. So the takeaway here is that as adults, when we understand stress, it not only broadens safe practices, but it also helps us in creating the right conditions in which children can, can prosper. So it's our responsibility to change and shift those conditions so that children can prosper and thrive. So what I want us to do now 
is to, to think about that. We, we've thought about being therapeutic and we listed some ways, um, in ways that children can prosper and thrive. I want us to use a thinking stem, just pick any one thinking stem and complete one of those thinking stems around children prospering and thriving um, in connection with us, out of stress. Mm -hmm. Is this an activity for the chat to put yes, in the chat? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I said that. Was it only in my head? I'm sorry. This is a chat box activity. We're responding to the thinking stem prompt and we're typing it in the chat box. I'm not so sure, Laura Fish. Laura <laughs> Fish, I wish I was in your head, Sean. <laughs> That's so funny. How about a couple of examples to sort of prime the pump, Sean? Oh, sure. Um, I would say I've noticed stress uh, lessons for children when I'm not stressed. Nice. So Alexa said, I know distress causes my level of patience to decrease greatly. Mm -hmm. That's for most of us. Modifications are important to grow. I've noticed stress first. I have to regulate myself first, definitely. Slow down and stop multitasking. Mm -hmm. I've noticed stress is affecting sleep patterns and then affects the rest of the day for the children we serve. That is spot on, Brianna. And Brianna, um, Miss Valerie, whose video we saw last week, the little boy that she was talking to, um, his stress was activated because he really didn't sleep at home or at school and it affected actually how he navigated the space, which is why she was so centered on giving him the time and attention um, or he, you know, you would see and experience a different behavior from, from him in her family child care home. Um, someone said, I'm figuring out that children feed off adults energy when they are around, definitely. I've noticed that my tone says the environment in the room. Amparo, that is totally spot on. Uh, children feel our stress. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking I can help children blossom into creative thinkers. That is wonderful. Uh, modifications are important because not all kids learn the same way. I've noticed stress causes me to be not present in the classroom and not meet the children's needs. Oftentimes it gets in the way. Calm in myself. I've noticed the stress, I cannot have energy, so it saps your energy. My stress level blocks children so that I try to calm not just myself, but also the child. Mm -hmm. One idea is, it's wild to me that we often forget the stress does affect the child in the environment and, st and stress the child. Mm -hmm. So years ago, uh, with Cynthia Hammock, I'm gonna finish with this and then we're gonna move on. She was a center director in the city of Oakland's Head Start program. And she's since retired, um, but she would come to work every day on, on time. She was there before the site opened and she really set the tone for the building. Um, and then, you know, her daughter was in Sacramento and she kept telling us, but you know, I'm not there every day. She said, I won't be here on this day. I'm going to Sacramento because my daughter's going to, you know, have her pregnancy induced. And I show up one day and I walk into the building and I immediately could sense that something didn't feel right. So I'm, I'm walking around and I'm like, oh, where's Miss Cynthia? And they said, oh, she's in Sacramento visiting her daughter. Oh, that's right, she wasn't gonna be here today. But you could feel the, the tension brewing in the building. So I said, well, who's in charge? And they pointed to the one of the teachers and they said, well, she's the go-to person. So I go and I check in with her and see how things going. And she immediately says, I'm so anxious that Miss Cynthia isn't here. She says, I really want her to come back. What she was giving me was what I felt when I walked in and that everybody else in the building could feel her uneasiness with being left in charge. Um, she just wasn't ready. She literally was not ready to be left in charge of a relatively small site. Um, so when Miss Cynthia came back, I shared my observations with her around in her absence, the tone that was set was totally noticeable when you walked into the building. So we've got to be aware of that um, and sometimes pass it on to somebody else and say, 
you know, this one isn't for me today at this moment. All right. That's really, really big for young children, especially young children who are trying to tune into you and need you to attune to them. And they're feeding off of what we show up with. Um, if, it, if it's stress or not. Thank you all for that. So over the last five weeks, we've met Naeem, Zoe, Wyatt, and uh, Nevea, and we were introduced to all of their stress stories. So today we're gonna actually get introduced to Mariah's stress story. And remember their stress story does not define them, it's just one aspect of who they are. So I'm going to read it to you all because I see a few people are on the phone. Um, Mariah is a four-year-old with mild autism. During lunch and snack times, she becomes aggressive, pushing her teachers and others. Mar Mariah is strong and her actions often make the adults step back. Mariah's family is often called and asked to pick her up early when this happens. Having to frequently leave work to pick up Mariah has caused a problem for both of Mariah's parents at their jobs. Mariah's family ultimately withdrew, withdrew her from the program without notice. So what I want you to do is just consider that. And of course, there's always pieces missing, but oftentimes we show up and we don't have the full and complete story. And sometimes we never access the full and complete story and that shouldn't stop us from what moving forward to support Mariah. So what I want you to kind of consider, you know, in the perfect world, we would have gotten pushed into a breakout room. You would have been in groups of four to discuss this. Um, but I want us to just put our feedback in the chat. And if someone is brave enough, unmute themselves and share with us your name and your response to these three questions. What happened to Mariah during this period? Who else was affected by the school's actions? What might have been a better plan for Mariah and her family? Um, so we can do both type in the chat box, our responses and, okay, I see Donna and Lacey have both unmuted themselves. Is that to share out Donna and Lacey? Yes. Okay, I'm not sure who's speaking. Is Lacey, okay. We're going to listen to Lacey's response to Mariah's stress story. Go ahead, Lacey. Um, I would be asking, um, since it's during lunch and snack times, I would be asking what her dietary needs are um, and if we are providing um, the correct food for her, if she has any um like allergies or specific needs um and bring that back to the parents maybe mm -hmm. um, because maybe she can't communicate um that she's not able to eat these certain foods that we're providing um because she's mildly autistic um but it did affect her parents because it said that they had to leave their jobs yeah. Um, but maybe they weren't communicating um, the school and the parents um, fully to work out some type of um, better situation. Thank you for that, Lacey. So Lacey said what she would want to do is first examine um, Mariah's nutritional needs and expectations to make sure that they were being met around. Um, oftentimes, we know some children, specifically children who have, may have an autism diagnosis, um, are really particular about foods, certain foods, certain textures. So Lacey said she would want to drill down deeper to make sure that we're providing the right sustenance for Mariah. And if we needed to substitute it, or maybe if the parents could, could she would say she's starting there at that point to uh, delve deeper into the investigation to support um, Mariah. So thank you for that, Lacey. Then I see Deborah McFadden um, unmuted. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I I do agree with the diet situation. And sometimes I, I guess I was wondering, could it possibly be that Mariah wanted food or more of one particular food than the teachers were willing to give her? And then secondly, um, I agree that sending her home does impact the family um, and, and their work um, capabilities. Mm -hmm. And 
I also feel that Mariah was probably getting some negative feedback from her family in terms of her acting out, as they may describe it, at school. And then I think a solution would be for me is to really find ways of giving, getting some therapeutic help for her within the school setting and supporting teachers as they have to, um, you know, deal with her behavior. Awesome. That's, that's it. Thank you all. These are, see, this, I love it when EC folk do this because it says we all have these different lenses and we are all on the path, but sometimes when we're in it, or as Laura Fish would say, when we're in the movie, we can't see the movie. And these opportunities help us to step out of the movie to see what's actually happening. Um, so I see Amparo, then Marilyn, and then Valerie Hamilton. So in that order, Amparo, Marilyn, Martin, and then Valerie Hamilton. Hi, this is Amparo with Abode Services. And I was thinking, um, previously working with children and adults um, with developmental disability, um, I think Mariah should, maybe should have some choices, options, um, maybe um, picks where she can choose what the snacks that she prefers that could be the issue, or even the iPad where she can press the button and say, I want this instead of that. Um, it could be that she just dislikes um, dislikes what they're feeding her. And then obviously the parents are affected and the whole family. And what I think would have been a better plan for the, uh, for Mariah would be for them to review her ISP and work together with the regional center, her teachers and her parents or family and figure out, set some goals. Another th um, thing that I was thinking about was her having a one-on-one, -on -one, um, maybe teacher um, aid during that period to just focus on her and give her more attention. Okay, thank you, Amparo. Yes. Marilyn Martin? Yes, I was thinking because I um, raised my nephew and he was mildly autistic and during certain times he would experience, they would experience some of the same behavior. And, and looking back in hindsight, as he gotten older, it was triggers. You know, maybe every day they're changing her place in line, or they're changing when they call her up to receive what she wants. They're moving her from her natural routine, and mm -hmm. she's not comfortable with that. And so she acts out in a negative way, because sometimes the, the children, they have like a, a a sense of I need to do it this way every day. And because they're not doing it that way every day, it could cause her to become very aggressive as well as them uh, contacting the parents every day. That can be very frustrating because uh, if both parents are working, it's because they need to work. And calling them and having them to come and pick her up every day or disrupting their day, that can, that can have be stressful for them in the workplace, which that stress will then carry over into the home for her because they, they're trying to figure out, okay, what can we do to help her? And so I think that if there was a way to set up, like I think someone else has said, sit down and set up a plan of action to mm -hmm. work with her. What can we change? What are the triggers that are triggering her to go off? Because there has to be a trigger. And so if we could define what that trigger is, then we could be able to make sure that she's first in line or that she's third in line or that we give her her seat back that she had when she goes back to her table. And so it is frustrating to the parents having that have happened to them. I understand that, having to call off every time that um, the school calls to go pick up your child. Thank you, Marilyn Martin. Um, then we have Valerie Hamilton, our, our, our last share out. Uh, good, good morning. This is Valerie Hamilton, a family child care provider. And I think it's very sad that when a child acts out or when there's problems that the child is excluded. And that to me is, I've always said to myself, I will never exclude a child regardless of, of what is going on. I'll have to figure out in some way, fashion or form to help that child to get through the day and to help the family. But to me, calling, you know, sending the child home is just gonna make it worse for the child and for the family. But anyway, I just wanted to say that. And I think it is important to 
uh, work with each child individually to find out what could what could help them uh, going forward. Definitely. Thank you. That was it. Those. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate all of those responses because I think collectively, when we when we get together to explore these pieces of a puzzle, we actually learn more. So these are things we shouldn't be doing in isolation when we're trying to support young children. Multiple perspectives or, or an interdisciplinary approach is often the way. So a few things I want to share um, that I need us all to be clear on that were happening in the background. Um, Mariah was being suspended from school, everyone. Those phone calls, this is the Office of Civil Rights. If you read anything related to our suspension and expulsion and termination in preschool in this country, Mariah was considered having a soft suspension. It's oftentimes unnamed, but it's a suspension by definition. So we've, we've got to understand that part. On our end, we were suspending a child on the spectrum who has an IEP and none of that was taken into consideration, okay? The other part that we've known, and this is our documented, that when children are suspended and expelled, even by unnamed suspensions, it actually creates more stress for the family. It creates a rupture, oftentimes between the child and the parent. Now the parents are stressed because of what they're being told about their child. So they feel helpless and hopeless. And some of that often gets directed towards the child, which is then what creates a rupture between that parent and the child. Second thing to consider. Third, no action was taken to support Mariah's diagnosis in the context of school. And some of you brought that up. That becomes very important that in that classroom, there should have been a plan in place from the beginning. So if any of you are working in places and you have children like Mariah that some of you talked about, there needs to be a plan in place. Meaning if she is four and she has a diagnosis, she probably has an IEP. Or if she's, she's there, she should. If you don't have access to it, you should be asking the family to give you access to it. It may be difficult to read, it might not even make sense to you, but that's when you can ask someone else. So before I move to the next one, I wanna share um, a personal story. You know what, I'll do that to keep, at the end, to keep on track. So the other part about that plan in place to support her integration and learning is that multidisciplinary team coming together, having access to the IEP, the teaching team, the director, if you have access to a mental health specialist, or an early learning specialist or a coach and the family, of course, all saying, here's what we know and have observed about Mariah um, so that she can be fully integrated as much as possible into the environment. The other part is to remember that the three core for children who actually have that diagnosis are really big in the preschool years, communication, socialization, and behavior. I'll say it again, the three core around communication, socialization, and behavior are really what we're supposed to be helping her build capacity around over time. So those partnerships with the family, those partnerships with programs and community-based services outside of your school, all should be wrapped around Mariah. So the, the, the thing that never comes up is that she has to leave the program that disrupts our whole family's life, okay? so. Here's the piece that we often miss, that we often know children have IEPs, and this is what I often get from early learning professionals and parents. They'll say, I read it and it didn't make any sense. And oftentimes that's true. We read the IEPs and they don't make much practical sense to us around what's my role in this. Now to some credit, I have seen somewhere they're starting to be written in the much more uh, useful, friendly way so that we can read it and say, oh, this is what I should be doing with this child. I should be giving this child multiple opportunities to communicate. I should be modeling language. And we're gonna see some of that later um, where this child needs multiple opportunities throughout the day for socialization with the supportive adult and some, some peers as clear learning goals for a child like Mariah. In addition to examining, like most folks said, is this nutritional piece okay? Is she being triggered by what's being offered? Is it she being triggered by the smell? It should be triggered by the texture. Oftentimes we might not know, but the family might know. Um, oftentimes those things are written in the enrollment packet. When families sign up and they're having to fill out a packet this thick, they write those things down, but then the person who does enrollment, 
99.9% of the time isn't the teacher. So we never see that. So if we don't build a relationship with the family, we never know she doesn't like soft carrots. We don't know um, that she likes raw broccoli. She doesn't like it steamed. We don't know all those things that she prefers apples and not oranges. Or we don't know that she actually prefers bananas over pears. We have to figure that out by communicating with the family. So that plan in place would include all of that. Like many of you said, taking a step back and investigating how to support Mariah. And in support, one of the things that we should not be doing is calling parents to pick their children up, as I think Deborah McFadden said, and, and Ms. Valerie said. Like, th those are the things that we've got to remove from uh, a strategy, because they're not strategy. They're really communicating to the family, we're giving up on you and your child, which is why the family withdrew without giving the program um, notice. So I know I said a lot there, and um, really, really important, because this story has happened multiple times um, that I witnessed. Of course, you can ask the question, um, is that Aura? Yes, it's me. Um, so I know, listen to what you're saying. You're, you're, you're saying, and I agree with you, that we should not be calling parents, right? But how would you manage, or how would you speak to a teacher who's constantly calling, and when you provide the teacher, it is, you know, like a, um, it's, what's, uh, a feedback, positive feedback, or uh, abstracted feedback, she gets upset. How would you manage that part? Because I have, I have a teacher, and I constantly letting her know, do not call parents because her first option is, let me call the parent, and let me call the parent. But I noticed that every time I let them, I, I tell her, do not do this, because you know I completely agree, if I wouldn't be a mom, I don't have any kids, but I'm in charge of 30 toddlers. But if I have a, a child and I have to be at work, I do not really appreciate a teacher calling me, coming to pick up your child, because he's having a hard time, right? Uh, but how would you manage that part? Or how would the conversation with this teacher will be knowing the fact that she gets upset or kind of gets um, disagree with you of not calling the parents? Right. So a, a few things that, um, as a former center director, that I often did was, number one, understand each teacher individually and what the teacher's individual needs are, because we have needs as adults also and to try my best to meet that need. So it, it might be speaking with that person individually, but oftentimes my method as a supervisor um, for teachers who aren't following instructions are to bring the instruction to everybody so that we're all clear on what the expectation is. So if we're saying historically at this site, when children do things we don't like, we've always just called families. But maybe that was the history. So we're saying today we're starting a new, what, plan and that plan doesn't include calling parents. So everyone knows that. So the expectation has been set. We're asking questions, we're getting clear together. This is probably in, in, in the meeting. So then if I still have someone who falls out of that, I'm gonna pull that person inside and say, can you tell me what happened? Why did you feel the need to call that parent? I'm gonna to listen to them essentially. I'm asking a bunch of questions for them to get out while they're doing it. And then I'm setting the expectation. This probably will happen again. If you feel that you don't know what else to do, come get me. Or, you know what, go take the child to Beth. Beth said she works really good with her. I'm giving you two strategies instead of calling the family. And then when I'm meeting with you again, I'm really setting the tone of calling the family is not what we do. Um, and then I might use some general expectations of us as adults around um, being at work. And if you asked me a question or had a need, um, and I gave you, I'm probably going to do this intentionally, depending on the teacher, give them a response that makes them step back and say, that's crazy. So if you said, oh, I want a day off. And I said, well, I can't sign it. I need to call HR first. And I started drilling down in this weird way. Sometimes I've worked with teachers where that was what they needed to hear. Um, the other piece that I think around children that we want to call their families are oftentimes creating a real relationship with their family that says, what I don't want to do, what's happening at 10 o'clock, you pick your child up at 545. So if I call you at 10 o'clock and then you get here at 1045, your child may not even be in that situation anymore. So I've disrupted your day. So as a parent building a relationship that says, 
how do you handle these things at home when they happen? What could I do here when I'm caring and educating for your child or children that makes sense in the context of group care? And knowing that everything that a family does at home, we can't replicate in group care because we're bound by some different expectations, but the parent will reveal to you some key strategies that we can replicate that are familiar to the child or children at school. So I know I said a lot. I would start, I would, I would start there. Um, I, I really would around doing multiple things of supporting that teacher and offering up strategies after I've, um, I've listened. Thank you. Thank you for the, for the question. All right, where were we, Beth? Mariah's story. Thank you all for that. Thank you all for, for that. And we're gonna, we're gonna gather throughout the rest of our time together some more ways to support um, the Mariahs of the world. So typical development um, is really patterns of growth within development that all children have. They vary from child to child. They often can vary depending on culture and environment. And it's really about um, those things called developmental milestones. So in those developmental milestones oftentimes show up in things like the ages and stages questionnaire. They show up in things like the DRDP. Um, what is it? The um, uh, teaching strategies gold. All of those things have developmental milestones embedded in them. And what we're looking for are behavioral skills that emerge in young children over time. Um, and what we know is when they're grouped together for most children over time, we call those typically development, developmental markers or behavioral skills that children acquire. And they usually, those skills usually fall within these five areas of being cognitive or academic, being language-based, being motor-based, uh, being socially based and being adaptive. I'm able to shift and change and do some things for myself. So I move from you doing it for me to me doing it on my own. Um, and these categories in terms of behavioral skills, really children, they show strengths in areas of development and then they show needs and or some slower developing skills in other areas. All of that is typical for children. So you might have a child who has the wonderful ability to understand your language in terms of what you say. So their receptive skills are really, really high, but that same child might struggle with verbal expression, telling you what they understand and what they heard, even though they fully understood it, they may not be able to communicate. Doesn't mean that child has a delay or they, they're atypically development, developing. That really means that we've got to understand development as a spiral and not in this linear way. So historically, we've always understood development as starting here and moving there. When we add the cultural pieces to it, what we've understood down is development is a spiral and that children will be on different points in that spiral. Um, and it's our job to then what differentiate and individualize and scaffold, which are the harder parts of the work. So you may be saying, well, okay, Sean, I get that. So what about atypically developing children? So again, we're looking at those patterns of skill development um, that some children show in terms of the, those behavioral skills. So for atypical, we're looking for unusual um, behavioral skills that are oftentimes marked, markedly different from their peers, okay? So the big piece here that I want you to understand in terms of atypical development, and most of us have those tools and checklists to use to guide us in knowing the difference between a typically developing set of skills and something that may be atypically developing. And we don't do it ourselves. Then we say, hey, this is what I've been noticing to a family. This is what I've been noticing to the specialist. We then seek what? More support. But there's a world of difference between a skill that is delayed and one that is disordered. Really, really different. And that's one of the big takeaways that I want you to understand around stress-inducing adults who don't understand when the child may has a, has a delay that we can actually support that child and what remedy in that opposed to a child who has some real significant skill disordered development, which means we should still support that child. However, the delay we can support, meaning giving you the right what? Language modeling, phonological awareness to build those expressive language skills. But if you have what a disability, 
I can support you in gaining some skills, but your disability never goes away. And oftentimes people collapse them on top of each other um, and get confused, all right? So in those patterns of skills, our observations should really tell us if we see a severe weakness or area of concern, or if this is just a period of uh, development for a child, which is why we need to talk to the family to figure out if something is going on, because we know stress can what cause children to regress and go back to earlier behaviors. For a preschooler, it may seem toddlerish. For toddler, a toddler, it may seem what? Like an infant. So the four big things that we say teachers and families should really understand is the time and emergence of the skill is what we need to consider. How was the skill sequenced? The quality of interactions, again, between those, that child and the adults. And how was it showing up and how that child functions in the world? And for us, it's largely early learning settings. So we need to really take great care to distinguish between skills that are slow and emerging and those that are different in quality, form, and function. So really, knowing the difference between a skill that is slow and emerging by using all those tools I named and one that is different in terms of quality, form, and function that says this child needs something different. So here are the strategies that we want to offer up for you to, to use. For atypically developing children, watch the areas of concern. That simply means keeping an eye out for children who need extra attention. Mariah needs extra attention. That means asking yourself, how is she going to solve this social problem on her own, even at the table? She needs my support. I need to do some investigation. The second one is noticing small stresses. So if we think of Wayne, Wyatt, Zoe, Nevaeh, and Mariah, we would watch out for small gains that they're making in learning and celebrate them. In other words, we need to make sure that children know that we see their progress, despite what their progress not being where their typically developing peers are. The other piece is to acknowledge emotions. We always want to do this first. And for those who participated in session one, two, and three, this whole big piece of emotions came up. Very, very important to notice, can I emote and tell you how I'm feeling? Or can I not? Or do I need the adult to do it for me? The third piece is these intentional interactions. Oftentimes, the Mariahs of the world, they need us to what? Warrant reteaching of skills. They need us to warrant offering a mini, le a mini lesson. They need multiple opportunities to practice and repractice and repractice and repractice all of those areas of socializing, all those areas of behavioral expectations, and all those areas of what communicating. We oftentimes in early childhood call, in an early childhood call those teachable moments. Families don't recognize them as teachable moments. They recognize them as what, I want my child to be able to do X, Y, and Z by this time. So our role is to then what model for the families also around age appropriate expectations in a respectful way. So the additional part for the Mariahs and the Vayas and Naims and Wyatts of the world is becoming a stress detective and asking yourself a series of questions. Do you find time to connect with children throughout the day? You don't have to answer that now. Are we watching for children that need extra support to lower their stress before their stress load becomes too high? And then they what? End up pushing at the lunch and snack table. What happened before was the pivotal piece for Mariah and not just the act, but what was happening in her life? What were the pieces that I was missing as the adult, the adult around who I needed to talk to, what I needed to read, what did I need for support? to support her in what? Staying at the lunch table and trying some food and getting through that daily event. The other stress question that it becomes hard for us as adults to take in is, are children comfortable seeking support from you as the adult? And if we're honest, most of us should say yes and no, depending on who those children are. And the three children that you're thinking of who you know never come to you, it's probably an issue of relationship and you could be a stressful or a stressor in that child's what relationship with you. And the honest, the more honest we are, the more that we can shift our response and do something different. And for those of you who've heard me speak before, 
I've been talking honestly over the eight, what, the, the last five years about my godson, who's now eight, and how his stress load really made me feel a different way um, until I began to shift my response to him and our relationship began to change and his stress load began to go down and so did mine. And one of the ways I did that was by doing this thing here, responding to his unmet need in a timely and rich way. And I accepted that I wasn't always doing for him what I did for his sister because, I, because of our temperaments. Two last pieces of becoming a stress detective are, are we noticing the emotions, the affects and the discomforts from children? Remember last week we talked about the universal ones and the ones that must be taught around emotions. And after we notice them, are we acknowledging them? Have we given time and attention for us to say, was I taught emotions as a child? Was that modeled for me? So as an adult, do I have language? Do I have words for the emotions that I feel? Because if I don't, then I can't acknowledge them or teach them to young children. So I can't what, help lower a child's stress load around that if I haven't done it for myself, all right? So I'm gonna skip this pause the process just because we spent a little more time um, earlier. So historically, we would have stopped there. And I'm gonna jump right into the modifications and adjustments um, because I wanna give us a small break before we finish up. So basically, modifications and adjustments consider the what, the when, and the why. So the what is what I often tell adults are, are the changes in activities, experiences, and materials in the child's environment, both indoors and outdoors. The when of modifications and adjustments are really considering when a child is not fully participating in a meaningful way and often when they're stressed. I'll say it again. The when is when children are not able to participate in meaningful ways, often because they're stressed. Then the why is really giving them access to participation lowers their stress so therefore they have a meaningful experience. Sounds easy to do, but for some of us it becomes hard. So let me break it down in a real practical way that will make sense for all of you. So there are eight kinds of modifications and adjustments. So the first one is an environmental modification, which usually is centered around a ranging of materials, how we group peers, and schedules. Think of optimal positioning or stabilizing. So what we see here are three photos. We see a photo of uh, mats on the floor for children to line up or sit down. In that middle photo, we actually see taped paper to the table so that it doesn't shift to stress a child or a child who actually has a need where standing is more stabilizing for that child. Then we see a teacher pointing to a child's picture and the child's shape to help that child know what, this is where you should be sitting on this shape, on this color. The next modification and adjustment is what we call material modification. So we see the little girl sitting on what? The shape and the color that her teacher pointed to in the earlier picture. Here we see modifications to a pencil where we wrap the tape around uh, the part of the pencil or the crayon so that children know this is where I what? Put my finger. Or a suction cup that just stays stuck to the table because this child has some motor challenges that really require them to have that level of support um, so that they can be independent and not have an adult do it. It really is about modifying the response. Think about this as these are times when we make things larger or brighter. And of course, simplifying the activity. So what we see here is really, what did you want to do when the child gets to pick and post it? Then we have a child with a, circle, a circular uh, puzzle and what's under the puzzle that you can't see in this picture is the teacher actually drew um, numbers on the base of the puzzle and in the piece so that the child would know what there's a simple adjustment so you can break it down into smaller parts and put the number one where the number one is or to put the star where the star is there are a variety of ways to achieve that in terms of reducing the stress load for the child and probably one of the ones that I use early and often is child preference. You know, integrating a child's preferred toys and activities uh, and taking advantage of that so they're not so stressed. And we're gonna watch a short video 
of two teachers who actually are trying two different things. I mean, one teacher who what lumped strategies together. And for those who were in session one and two talked about, we often find su success when we what do what lump multiple strategies together um, to support young children. Another uh, type of modification and adjustment is really adult support. Us showing up to participate and learn and not standing back, but facilitating the play is what we often call it as a crucial piece of lowering child stress. And of course, using special equipment. So here there's a bucket full of different types of scissors. Um, this child actually has some sensory needs. So this, their participation is to really what, sit on a different type of equipment. My second probably highest used modification is peer support. I know my nephew who's now 17, will be 17 on the 5th um, of this month. And my nephew who turned 12 August, I mean, August, who turned 12 August the 22nd. When they were younger, the 17 year old knew how to ride a bike. And we were trying to teach the younger one, he was like four or five, how to get on the bike without the training wheels. And he just couldn't do it. His mother tried, his father tried, I tried, you know, his grandmother tried, his grandfather tried. None of it was successful without support. And I ended up sitting down and I asked my older nephew at the time, help him learn to ride the bike. When I say he used the same words that I used, and my nephew actually held the bike up and pedaled from one end to the other without support. Children learn differently from their peers than they learn from us, even if they say the same thing. There's something different about the nature of the relationship coming from an adult and coming from a peer. And um, the final type of modification and adjustment is what we call invisible, invisible support. These are oftentimes thoughtfully sequenced turns and activities and experiences that actually help create what a child's level of engagement and reduce their stress. So here in this uh, transitional uh, preschool classroom, children who are moving from two and a half to three, they actually have their pictures on the table. Some people say, I hate that, but in this classroom, um, it seemed to work in terms of reducing children's stress loads and disruptions. Um, in this preschool classroom, they grouped the children um, with teachers, but they didn't use the teacher's names, they used colors so that children could look at the color and know that's the group that they were in um, as a way to modify without having to remind the children these levels of invisible support. All right, so it's been about an hour. So what we're gonna do now, and I just wanna let you know what's gonna happen. We're gonna watch two videos and then we're gonna take a short break um, because we like to give you a break between the hour of the two hours that we're together. Um, so the first video is really a strategy of using direction words. Then the second video is a strategy of using the first then board. And then we're gonna talk about them both, but I'm gonna play them back to back and then we can uh, talk about them. The doggy went inside in the sandbox to see if his, was his teddy bear there? No. no. He went around the wagon to see around the wagon. Can you make him go around the wagon? Around the wagon. He went, not yet, he went near the mailbox. Can you make him go near the mailbox? Is he there? Not inside. He's not in the mailbox. Then he went up the tree and he went behind. Where was the teddy bear? He was behind the tree and he went back into his bed. So you tell me where I take my doggy. And the puppy go around the mailbox. Around the mailbox. And see the teddy bear in the mailbox. And in the mailbox, he's not there. So what does he do now? Then he go around in the wagon. He goes around the wagon. And he go up in the 
sandbox. He goes and where in the sandbox? In the sandbox. He, he goes in the sandbox. No teddy bear. And she goes around in the tree and she in the teddy bear. And she goes. Can you show me around in the tree? Oh, no. Around. No teddy bear. So what is? And she climbs in the tree and she. She climbs in the tree and he's not behind. And she up and she the tree. And where is the teddy bear? In the wagon. In the wagon. And she go in her bed and sleep in tight. All right. So that was the first video around positioning, uh, which really is about developing spatial awareness and language skill acquisition to lower child stress. In this second video, uh, which is another strategy, um, oftentimes it's about supporting our understanding of helping young children around expected behaviors. It's sometimes called the win-win. It's been documented that it lowers child stress. It's often used as a behavior change strategy and there's often a missed opportunity to teach children concretely through a stress, clear expectations to lower and limit their confusion. So what you're gonna see here in this inclusion classroom is the Head Start teacher um, is trying to get him to say, first I wash my hands and then I get snacked. And the special education teacher comes in um, and she's using a, uh, a child preferred item. So she's lumping multiple strategies together and then you're going to see his response when she shows up. Um, and I'll tell you, at, at the same time, it doesn't always work for both teachers because they're not on the same page around it, but it works for him. All right, so what we basically just saw, and um, so you, someone typed in just the audio, not the video. So you should have seen two videos and the audio. So I'm not sure what was happening. Um, apologies for if you weren't able to see the video, the person who wrote it in the chat. Uh, here in the first then strategy, they're really trying to get Brian to wash his hands because he wanted to sit at the table and eat a snack. Um, and he wasn't responding. And the teacher was really patient and she said, you know, if you're not ready, you know, say not ready again, trying to meet one of his IEP goals of getting him to use what expressive language. And then when the other teacher shows up, she clearly does what? Shows up when she walked in, she took the toy off the shelf, brought it to him and he what? Responded. And certain times teachers feel different ways about this, which is why understanding modifications and adjustments role in supporting children is very important because in their meeting, one teacher kept saying it was manipulative, it was manipulative, and it wasn't. It was a clear strategy that she learned and because she was observing and knew this was his preferred toy item, she brought that to him so that he could do what? Wash his hands. Um, very, very different than doing that throughout the day, all day for every uh, single child. So before we, oh, someone, does someone unmute himself? Beth, did you unmute yourself? Okay, no, all right. So what we're gonna do now, before we jump into some more modification and adjustment pieces that really get you to understand the difference, is we're gonna take a short break, um, and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna watch two videos 
that you can share with families around activities that they can do at home for those who work directly with families. So Evelyn McGee said, was that a bribe? No, it wasn't. It was a strategy really, really different that um, works for children who need us to understand how to modify and adjust what we're offering and what we show up as related to learning goals and lowering stress, which is really the fundamental difference. Um, but thanks for the question, Evelyn. I also want to remind people that um, we're having an office hour with you, Sean, um, on okay. September, Thursday, September 24th from 10 to 11. And those of you on the call today will be getting an email about it. So you'll, so it's a time for Sean to be available and answer some of your personal questions that you might have in your, from your work. So that's again on Thursday, September 24th from 10 to 11 in the morning. It's a new thing we've started called the virtual office hour where you can come and get a little bit of consultation about individual questions that you have. So um, more to come on that. You'll be getting an email. Thank you. the break, Sean? I forgot all about it. Yes, we're going to start, we're going to start our break. Um, so the, the goal of the consultation for those who are still listening is really for you to go back, chew on these strategies, and then come back and say, hey, I'm working on this. This is what happened um, because I'm not in your program. So it was just a way for you to come back and say, I've reflected on some things or this seems to work. I've tried to use this, but maybe I have some confusion about it. It's just a way for us to spend an uh, hour together for me to be responsive to um, those who want to drill down deeper or are drilling down deeper and just have some, um, some questions or thoughts around moving uh, continuous moves forward. All right, so let's take 10 minutes, Beth. Actually, okay. can, we do, can we do seven minutes, Beth? Sure, seven right. minutes, everyone. Here we go. Um, welcome back, everyone. I was talking and no one heard me. Um, I hope you were all able to take a break and get your needs met. It's important to uh, move around after you sit for 60 minutes. So someone asked the question, where can I retrieve the certificates for the trainings? So after the training, um, you're going to link from Leah to your evaluation and um, one of those links. I forget which uh, will yeah. have oh. evaluation, I mean, your certificate uh, in the email from Leah. So you'll yeah. be there. after you complete your evaluation, then you can print out your certificate. So. That's what it is. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. And that is a bribe. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was in there some kind of way. <clears throat> Thank you, Beth. So before we begin, I just want to share some resources with folk who want to go deeper um, that. Uh, I think are, are are great. So Leah put a thing in the chat box. If you're having trouble printing out the certificate, you can email her for a copy, um, but really try to print it out. And I'm just gonna say, don't bother her. Leah is always very, very busy. Um, so if she can miss that. Well, you can also email me. This is Beth and you know, so yeah. That's true. Thanks Beth. So I just wanted to share um, four resource books that I think are, are awesome. So the first one is Teaching the Moving Child. Um, this book really fundamentally changed my understanding of movement in the brain, along with um, a professional development I went to, but it's a great, great resource um, that was written a few years ago that um, if you have a study reading group at your job or your work, this is awesome and I highly recommend you take a look at it. Um, this book that I've um, recently started, but I haven't finished, but I'm enjoying it, um, really looks at this woman's therapeutic approach to um, using Legos, um, and it has nothing to do with the Lego Foundation. It was just what the kids really gravitated towards um, in a therapeutic way. So a lot of the stuff that we covered in the last four sessions, she's literally naming them and covering them in this book. So uh, yeah, if you work with young children in any kind of meaningful way, this could be a great resource for you. Um, and then two books by the same author. Um, the first one, um, which is Come and Play, um, looking at sensory integration that many of you may have, uh, really has great examples. And then she's breaking down lots of practical uh, pieces for you in the inside. Um, and then the same author um, with Ants in the Pants, uh, Movement. This is written, so they, they're both talking about movement, but here she's talking about more of what I think of as um, the brain. And this one can be considered more academic 
Um, and this one is straight practical around um, adaptation, jumping right into the classroom of what you could do. So um, just some resources that I wanted to share that I found helpful that uh, you may find helpful on your journey. All right. And I want to let people know that I put some like Google and Amazon links in there with the books, but we always ask that you buy your books from a local um, bookstore. So mm -hmm. I know Bar Marcus Books is open in Oakland. So uh, it's a black owned bookstore. So that's an that's a great store to buy your your things from your books from. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Beth. Um, so the next two videos are really from um, an agency called Understood. Um, it's a great, I think they, 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 they have done great work. Um, they changed their website over the years when they upgraded. So a lot of the places where stuff used to be, I can't find it anymore. And I really haven't figured out why they, they did it. Personally, I thought the old website was better, but they updated and now I can't find anything on there. Um, but the next two videos are really videos that you can share with families um, in ways when we're thinking about being at home with children, where families historically aren't at home with their children for hours on end, seven days a week. Um, these two, I found, um, they may not translate into our work with children at our in our early learning settings, but they definitely translate to families at home. So the first one is an, an accomplishment box. Um, so we're thinking of school-aged children and some preschool-aged children who could definitely do this. Um, and the families can make the box with them. And the second one um, is a token board, um, which I know many people reject, but with families who need structure and don't know what to do, we found that they've been really, really helpful. Um, on the token board in the video, because I'm just playing it one after the other, I would recommend reducing the number of tokens, because I think the number that they're using is for older children. Um, and the goal with younger children, you want them to reach the goal quickly so that they can um, experience that satisfaction and not so much stress and want to do it again. All right, with that said, I'm going to press play.
Awesome. So I see um, a, a, a response and a question in the box. So the question says, how early can you do an accomplishment box with a child? Um, I've seen them done with children as uh, young as four. I'm making an assumption that depending on the child, one could probably do it. And I'm thinking of some particular three-year-olds that I've met um, simplifying it. Remember, we want to do, we want to make the accomplishments about things that they've actually done, not pretend, um, and really building their internalized sense of uh, well-being. And I, I, I accomplished these things and I did these things is really the, the big takeaway. Um, also, it doesn't have to be individualized. For children at home, it could be uh, siblings together or it could be the whole family around, you know, we cleaned the kitchen today, or we watched the movie together, or you know, we raked the grass as a family. Whatever it is, the family can decide on how they want to, even though this one is directed towards um, uh, children with special needs, specifically from understood, um, who sometimes struggle with what accomplishment. So in that sense, it makes sense. Uh, I think presenting it to a family and then in an open-ended way so they determine um, what it means for them in an age-appropriate way, um, I think is sometimes what they have to hear from those of us in education and counseling around the expectation of how we would do an accomplishment box with the seven-year-old. I wouldn't do the same way with the four-year-old um, or with the token system. Um, and remember, I said the token system isn't something that we're going to use at school, even though many of you who have children who are on the spectrum, if they're receiving support services, they actually utilize token systems with those children as um, one of their many strategies. Uh, not what I recommend you, you do with children at all as an individual teacher, but it is something that families can do at home. Um, in, this is my own professional lens that I think uh, COVID is unearthing a lot. Um, those who were in the first session where I quoted Lillian Katz, I really think as we're asking families to create routines and to mimic a lot of what we're doing at school, some of it is helpful for families, but some of it is not. We have the potential to cause families more stress by asking them to replicate what we're doing at home. I think providing them an array of choices and then they get to dictate. My professional belief is that that's the most appropriate way that honors and respects all families because um, the family ultimately gets to decide when, where, how, and why. Um, so I took the long way around that says we're not doing those things at school. That's why it says we're offering these as two of many things that families can do um, across a continuum. And for a family that doesn't have a lot of structure, um, that reward system could be part of them bringing structure and follow through for the adult and the child. Um, if the adult is clear on, they're going to follow through on whatever that 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 thing is that they're agreeing upon with the child. So there's some other pieces embedded in that. All right. Someone's asking a question about stickers. I just answered it, Beth. That was my long way around response. That was your long way. Okay. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I didn't necessarily say yes or no. I basically said that at school is not something that we want to do, even though in some preschools, and I know in Oakland Head Start specifically, they use Cesar uh, Puerto to support them with children who've been referred. And oftentimes those are the children whose threshold where they may not have an IEP um, or they may have one or they're waiting on the full diagnosis or the write-up. So they offered in-class support. And one of the things that they use with those children are, are tokens and stickers. It, they'll say, you know, if you follow these three things, then you pick something in the box and the person is in the classroom with them and they pull them to the side. And it's basically a, a box full of toys and they get to play with it for you know, a few minutes and then they actually go back to the group. Right. So it's, it's a different person who's doing that, not the Head Start or not the state preschool teacher. Okay. Um, and what I'm saying is those things at home may mm -hmm. be transferable for families, but, but um, it's but not, not what we're gonna do as the preschool general teacher um, in our early learning settings around the sticker as a reward system. Awesome, thank you. Great. And it's highly individualized, Beth. You may have a child, so, uh, you know, who really uh, could, you could generate lots of positivity from one individual child 
um, by using a, a sticker system of two other children, you may start seeing, you know, adverse behaviors that all generate from the same place, uh, which is why we're not saying that school, this is what we're doing, but at home individualizing for parents as a beginning step um, where I am, that it, it, it can work for some families, not all. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, this colorful chart that you see warrants some explanation. Um, so there's an arrow going from left to right, and there's an arrow going from top to bottom. The top part in the orange is really Erickson. The part in gold is Piaget, and in green is Anna Freud. Um, and then I added the pink. And for those of you who may have come to the um, Black Child Identity and Wellbeing training, you saw this chart in a different form because I had um, some Vygotsky stuff and how his research directly applied to um, Black children and language acquisition and how Black children in the United States express themselves. Um, but I left that part out. So what I want you to get from this uh, chart is really getting a fundamental understanding of the theory of how we move from sensory motor to pre-operational to concrete to formal operations. Um, and typically we're thinking of infants, toddlers, preschoolers, and school-age children. But because development isn't linear, it's spiral, as you see those spirals on those lines, which means we, we're no longer saying these are the things that only toddlers do. These are the things that only preschoolers do. You may have preschoolers who fall in that preschool round by age, but that may have a behavior that is really indicative of a 2.8 year old. You may have a toddler that's 2.5, but actually have expressive and receptive language that's indicative of being 3.5 years old. So because we understand now that development has always been spiraled, we understand it in this, in this way that's not so fixed in the box, even though I'm using boxes for visual learning. The big piece that I want us to take away in terms of stressing young children is how it unfolds. So we all show up in the sensory motor state where we're using our bodies as infants to take in the world and to learn. So when that sensory motor state is oftentimes satiated or satisfied, then we move to the next side. Oftentimes what we find, and I'm really going to hone in on that first column of sensory motor in the body, is when we're not providing children an, enough opportunities to work through that and to have a repetition in the sensory motor state, we thrust them into the pre-operational state or we thrust them into using toys um, to what we think is to have fun and to learn. And what they're doing is they're picking them up and throwing them across the room or they're putting them in their mouth or they're ignoring them because they really haven't done what, used their body enough to learn. So essentially in a perfect world, we would all show up in the sensory motor state, get our sensory motor needs met. Then we learn how to manipulate and investigate toys to play. You know, Beth, my preschool, she's my teacher. And she says, Sean, roll the red ball to me. Sean, let's put these blocks in the bucket. She's doing all of that and I'm learning. And she's saying, you know, let's um, use the paint and we're gonna make some creations on the paper. We're doing all these things to learn and then we get to what we call mature play, hopefully, where I say, you know what, this weekend is my abuelita's birthday and she loves chocolate cake. And then the teacher hears this and the teacher comes and she says, well, friends, you know what? Um, to make a cake, you're gonna need these things called ingredients. And then someone says, well, we can just go buy a, a box of cake. And then the teacher says, well, on the back there are instructions that say, you use what's in the box, but you have to add some other things. And when we mix those together, all those ingredients, help us bake the cake. Then I say, well, you know what? I'm going to be the mommy and you be the daddy and you be the brother and you be the grandmother. And then you're going to be the man at the store that we buy the groceries from. And we all take on these roles. And then we go to the store. We're in the pretend play area, the dramatic play space in the, in the preschool. And we do that and we come back and we pretend to bake the cake. And then it's now Saturday and it's Abuelita's birthday and we sing happy birthday. Um, all of that's indicative of mature play which is where the deeper learning occurs, which is where we want children to get to. And oftentimes what happens is all of those bumps in the road prevent all of our children from getting there because we don't understand the progression because too many of our children get stuck in the sensory motor state. And they get stuck there because what we've done 
in our stress-inducing behaviors, we've removed those natural open-ended materials like sand and water from our preschool classrooms, and we offer those only at certain times of the year, and we fundamentally have replaced them in all programs. I see this in state-funded, full-fee, faith-based, Head Start. Um, I see them across program types, I, I do, with uh, paper, seat work, dittos, worksheets, listening to the teacher, uh, and not realizing how it's directly related to an increase in child stress and how it was directly related to children not being able to move across that continuum. Um, so this is really about us understanding that we never stop using our bodies to learn. I'll say it again. We never stop using our bodies to learn. And the more that we understand that our bodies have a place in learning, not just for very young children, but for all young children and adults, then we have to rethink and reframe what we're offering to children in our inside and outside environments. So another way that I often tell people is think of this as we act, we speak, we create, and we design. For those of you who are into making maker spaces, I know I said a lot in the short frame, but really understanding that the takeaway is what sensory motor needs do children still have that we've basically removed from their learning experiences. Okay. So what is sensory processing? So I'm going to use this definition that what's well, not a definition in this example that came from the book Sensory Integration, a guide from preschool teachers. So this, I'm going to read the example and then I'm going to talk about it. So it says, you smell cookies burning in the oven, you see smoke, and you hear the oven timer buzzing. We go to the kitchen and remove cookies from the oven. So essentially, this person who's trying to bake these cookies and they end up, you know, watching the Housewives of LA and forget that it's on and they burn their cookies, Sensory processing is essentially using all the information collected through our senses. So that includes our hearing, our vision, our touch, sense of touch, sense of taste, sense of smell, movement, body awareness, and when they all work together, unity in daily life. Most of us kind of come into the world at birth or show up at birth with the ability to make, to take in sensory information, to organize it and make it useful so that we can enact upon it in terms of responding in the appropriate way to the sensory input. At times, some children come into the world and their brains are unable to receive that sensory input that's in the cookie example. So when that happens, then what we have to do is what make shifts or modifications and adjustments in how we provide the right environment to reduce their stress. So in this picture, this is from a preschool in San Rafael. Um, and there was a big commotion around um, when the director switched, they had a director switch and the new director um, had issues with the teachers letting the children take their shoes off to play in the sand, to play in the water or taking their shoes off in the inside. Um, and some children didn't want to take their socks off, their, their socks off so they kept them on. Um, and it became a licensing conversation the big piece for me that was the takeaway was they had documented months of behavior change in many of the children who were allowed to show up at school and remove their shoes at school. They actually had it documented that their behavior and wrong sensory input began to change. So what they really said was, we're not making it mandatory to take your shoes off, but if that's something you want to do, we want to be able to say, okay, in the midst of the director saying this is a licensing violation. Um, and it took them a long time to reconcile that. Um, and it made me think of my own life, that I'm that child with the socks on. I'm that, that, I was that kid who went to the beach and I love going to the beach, but that space where the sand and the water meet, I hate that feeling on my feet. So I'm someone who loves Puerto Rico. Um, I love going to uh, San Sebastian in Puerto Rico. It's one of my favorite places. But I have to, I bought these shoes that are waterproof so that the bottom of my what, feet don't touch that space. My mother, on the other hand, never wants anything on her feet. She walks around in the house 
barefoot all the time. I either have socks on, flip-flops, sandals, or shoes. The sensory input is different and both of us are what? Attempting to get our needs met. So the big question is, how do you reevaluate children getting their sensory needs met to reduce their stress? One way that I'll always um, advocate for is more sand and water, more open into play. It's an excellent, excellent medium. So Tiffany basically made this quote. She says, a child's sensory integration challenges are inextricably linked with his or her mental health. And I think that's worth hashtagging. That if we're really connecting a child's sensory integration, sensory integration challenges to mental health, then we need to reframe this and rethink about what are we limiting around that sensory motor unmet need that's here. Oops, wrong one. That sensory motor unmet need that's here um, that continues to show up and continues to be an unmet need that's stress inducing is the big question that I want you all to take back to your respective agencies as directors, as coaches, as mental health folk, as preschool teachers, as paraprofessionals, as family advocates, regardless of role and responsibility as a parent, um, how do we ensure that children's sensory motor needs are being met for development and to lessen and reduce stress in their lives is the big question. Okay, the real big question. Um, another resource I want to offer up to you with tons and tons of pins is uh, my Pinterest page. Uh, and, I, and, and I just decided not to add a bunch of slides with things from the Pinterest page because I want you all to really go and explore yourself. The, the hundreds of uh, opportunities for children to explore in different ways are, are there. Um, and I'm connected to another like sensory group. And there, there are thousands of pins. So I have, there are two under my page. One is mine, which is what you're looking at, which has probably, I think, like 200 activities and experiences and pins. And the other one that I'm connected to, which are multiple peoples, there are thousands of sensory learning experiences there that you can offer up in early learning settings. Um, so I highly, highly want you to activate that as um, a next step and a goal for you to explore how to reevaluate those sensory learning experiences throughout the day for young children. In your handout, I mean, in, in your fold handout folder, there are two uh, short articles that I think are phenomenal. The first one is Meeting the Sensory Needs of Young Children, which comes from NAYC's journal, Young Children. Um, and I highly recommend that if you read this, these should actually be something you take back to your, your work and say, hey, let's read this article together and talk about it. Because that's how we drill down deeper. Or to say, hey, I've been reading this article and I learned something. Can I share it with you? For those of you who may need to, you know, help your staff lean into or help your coworkers lean into um, this as a professional development. Uh, really, really great article. The second article, which is much older um, from Child Care Exchange, um, is really looking at a multi-sensory approach to nourishing all children. A phenomenal article because it really looks at um, the intersection of our sensory needs and how as teachers of young children, we can incorporate multiple things into one activity to help children learn. So they're not learning through one modality, but they're learning through what? Multiple modalities. Um, and it says diet. This isn't about food. This is about experiences related to what our senses. Really, really great article. So I highly recommend you go and check out those both, both of those articles in the, uh, the Dropbox folder. So now we're about to do a poll. We're going to do two polls today. So this is the first poll. Um, and we're jumping to fidgeting to relieve stress. Should you allow children to use fidgets in your classroom, playgroup, family child care, library, or health facility? Should you allow children to use fidgets in your classroom, playgroup, family child care, library, or facility? Um, it should be up on your screen now. It's a close into question. It's yes or no. We should have maybe added, added maybe, Leah. I'm thinking of that now. Okay, I'll give it a 
about 10 more seconds. It looks like half of folk have voted. Can we get the rest of the folk on the call to vote? All right, a little over half. Um, it would be great if we can get to over 70%. We're only at 61% people have voted. Should we allow children to use fidgets in the classroom, playgroup, family child care library or health facility? All right, Leah, let's bring it to a close. It's been a minute. Awesome, thanks to all of you who actually um, voted. This kind of virtual participation um, is important. It shifts things. So clearly this audience says that 83% of you believe yes and 17% of you say no. So we've learned some things about our audience, Beth and Leah. Yeah, absolutely. So I... Let's talk about that now. Let's talk about what we know about this thing called fidgeting. So here's some things we know. This is our research base. Fidgeting helps young children focus their attention. Meaning if I can fidget or, or rock or use a fidgeting object in my hands, or sometimes they have things for children to chew on if they have other sensory um, unmet needs, it actually helps them to focus. So think about that. So if your circle is 30 minutes long instead of 15 or 10 minutes long, and you have children to fidget, um, helping them to use the fidget activity and not telling them to stop, you're actually disrupting how they are focusing. And for those of you who've actually come to First Five Alameda, you know that oftentimes when you show up at a training on the table are lots of fidgeting objects um, that they provide for adults. Fidget feels good to your body. And this is often what young children will express if they have the expressive language, that it actually feels good. It feels what? Satiated and satisfying um, for young children to fidget. For many young children, it's a relief from stress, particularly children who have high energy. Um, it feels like they're taking a breath. You know, it feels like they're coming up from air um, to actually not be stopped in using a fidgeting object or in simply rocking. Um, I know it, it, my, myself and my, uh, I'm the oldest, and my brother Demetrius, who is uh, under me, and then my, my baby brother, who's 24, but acts like he's 12. And my mother always says, all of you shake your, you know, if we sit long, we all end up moving the same leg the same way. Um, and it bothers her and she always notices it. Sometimes I do it intentionally, but it's really a stress reliever for all of us. Um, but it bothers her to just watch it, which I think is really interesting. Um, fidgeting helps us what not have to get up and move around, because if I can sit still, or if I can rock, and still pay attention to my teacher, uh, I'm still what concentrating, I'm, I'm still focused, I'm actually focusing more because I'm satisfying um, an innate need that we oftentimes miss. So one of the things that I often uh, tell educators and families is that, and I think I shared this with this group, if this is our brain here, and this is your spine, and the end of the spine is here, and it's curved, and it ends right above um, our, our, our buttocks, that we don't show up like this, we actually show up in the world like this. And it's this that helps us do this. So if we were all in the room together, I would have at this point had everybody stand up and kind of just shake your body for a moment because you're actually moving your spine. And what we know is that we need to move first to sit still. And traditionally, we've told children sit still and then move. It's actually the opposite of what our brains are craving so this notion of letting children move or fidget is a developmental necessity that we must reevaluate and find ways to offer it to children throughout their times with us and around us. And it provides tactile stimulation. We saw that in one of the modifications in terms of the seat and it helps children to connect the calm. Um, so why wouldn't we want children to connect the calm? So all of these checks around fidgeting are research space. I didn't make them up. Uh, so for those who, that 17% that said no, here's something for you to reconsider around fidgeting's connection to lowering child stress. 
So for those of you who may say, well, you know, what, 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 what can I do? What can I do? So um, basically here we have a picture of stress balls, um, a, a motion stool, or some people call them wobble chairs, pipe cleaner that I'm sure all of us have within our, our schools of programs, some bouncy bands, which are that string that goes around the bottom of the chair, um, those textured tangles, which is that purple and blue and green thing. First five alameda has tons of those and theraputty, um, which is putty that you can play with and put back together, put it in the refrigerator and it lasts a, a very long time. Just a few things for you to connect with to help children relieve stress. Um, so here, is a, a, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna jump through the video. I'm gonna let you listen to Vanessa and Michelle and what they learned around taking their child. They're in Novato, California, um, and their school is in the old church and it's surrounded by nothing but green all around them. And they decided to, you know, get out of the school's playground, which is right on the grounds. And what they found was children began to shift and change and they learned some things around taking advantage of what was around them that they weren't taking advantage of. Um, so what I want you to take away from this is that time in nature has shown to lower cortisol levels or the stress hormone, hormone in young children. Time around nature has shown marked increase in cognitive or academic ability in young children. And time through nature has shown focus and attention in young children. Um, in some British preschools, they found that children whose classrooms faced um, a bunch of green, like I'm looking outside and see a tree and I see all this grass, that children who actually experience colors like green, blue, and beige, and there's some emerging research that now says lavender, um, colors found in nature actually did better. And in this school, in that research, what they found was the children whose classrooms were on the other side of the building and they didn't face any green, they found that all the children who face nature did better um, cognitively and academically um, in terms of their focus and able to follow through. Just something for us to consider around how are we helping children connect to nature um, as, a, as a strategy. So you know what, Beth, I'm rethinking because this video is probably eight minutes long because um, it was multiple clips. They were outside for like 45 minutes. Okay. Um, and in the beginning, they introduce themselves. Then you see the children and then they um, end up talking about it at the end. So what I'm going to do, Leah, I'm actually going to upload this video um, and put it in the, the Dropbox and lock it so that people can still go there and view it. I think it's an excellent, excellent video. It's about eight minutes long but I want to honor our time, okay? Great. Is that okay? Totally. Okay, awesome. So now I just want to quickly, um, as we wrap up this session, kind of go over some things that we've learned. You know, Cesar helped us understand how to support children using guided play um, when he observed that the children were talking about the fire that they all observed. Wendy demonstrated the power of social play in reducing uh, stress by providing access. Rebecca demonstrated that combined strategies um, in walking Messiah up through the brain from stress to connect it to learning was effective with the multiple strategies that she enacted. Um, Esther showed us the power of reflection and small shifts related to big body movement. Blake introduced us to the temperament's role um, in how we understand ourselves and children and stress. Audrey helped us see the importance of time, attention, and interactions. Ms. Valerie really demonstrated how to support stressed children through centering positive attention to build relationships. Cindy helped us to notice multiple relationships in early childhood and how they intersect and can cause stress or reduce stress. Latanya introduced us to attachment as a core strength, according to Bruce Perry. Um, and Juana introduced us to attunement. And Zana demonstrated attunement and practice for us um, skillfully. Uh, Mr. Ari introduced us to self-regulation as a co-facilitated interaction that's developed over time. And then Logan helped us to understand self-control as an outcome of self-regulation. And again, Zana demonstrated how we can skillfully facilitate play 
um, with young children. Sandy helped us consider the nature of needs for children experiencing stress. Um, and Whitney demonstrated how to embed meaningful emotional learning in our daily uh, experiences. Ms. Margaret introduced us to movement and music's role in lessening stress. And Ms. Deborah demonstrated intention in how to provide physical activities to reduce stress through play. And Janelle showed us the power of connecting emotionally during mealtimes um, and not always pushing content. And Margarita showed us how to link verbal and visual directions to really support children. So I've enjoyed my time with all of you, and I just want to leave you all with another great resource um, that helped me grow Alameda County First Five is there for providers and parents. And much of what we kind of talked about today, this is going to be a really great entry point for those of you who are confused and don't know where to go as providers or to resource parents there to get their child screened and to get them connected to services. It's a great, great resource um, and for families also um, as a resource that uh, I want to highly, highly recommend. So we just Thank have a, a closing poll in oh, terms great. of takeaway question um, that's going to come up on the screen now because we just always want to know where people are. So our closing poll for the day says, what was your most significant takeaway today? Was it understanding typical and atypical development, modifications and adjustments, sensory stress, um, or nature's role, even though we didn't get to watch Vanessa and Michelle? It's very interesting. It is. <laughs> Lots of appreciation in the chat for you, Sean. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give it like two more seconds. Okay. Yeah, it's been over a minute, Leah. Awesome. So it looks like the group said that modifications and adjustments was at the top followed by um, sensory stress, and then typical and atypical development. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing that. It's, it's, it's important for us to always gather information in a variety of ways. This was awesome, Sean. Um, we appreciate you so much. There's so much love coming at you. <laughs> well, thank you all for taking the time and attention to devote to you know learning more about ourselves and how we can support um, young children. Thank you all. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see if someone, let's see a certificate. Okay. Um, so, so let's see, Aaron, I'm, um, some people are asking, let's see about certificates. And um, I'm gonna put my email address in the chat box so if you have a question we have people from the philippines and thailand oh my gosh that's what it says in the chat box wow i had no that's, idea i didn't either from the philippines and thailand that's what it says wow are they in actually in thailand and the philippines or are that's where they're from and they're here i wonder i don't know it doesn't say it just says it doesn't say Promise. Well, that's wonderful. Hello. <laughs> Gosh, it must wonder what time it is there. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. wow. So there is my phone, my email address. And if, so if you have a question about a certificate, um, why don't you give me an email? Because I'd have to do a little bit of digging to figure that out. Um, we're so glad that you all came. I'm so appreciative of each and every one of you, the work that you do that's uh, it's just the work of the future. So all that you do is the most important work there is. So thank you so much for being here and look forward to seeing you at more trainings. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and say goodbye for the day. Happy Friday Eve uh, for a long weekend for some people. So um, 
thanks so much for being with us. Thank you all for participating in this series. I appreciate you all. Continue the Thank great you so day. very much for this training. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Sean. Thank you all. Thank you.